open. So today we're going to be looking at how different ecosystems and the different communities that each of those contain. So the first thing we need to consider is that in each differing ecosystem, so environment basically, we're going to have abiotic and biotic conditions. So different abiotic and biotic conditions. This is going to mean that certain traits are going to be favorable and so we're going to develop specific adaptations. Now the majority of this video is going to be concerned with identifying how those adaptations with those specific environmental conditions in that specific ecosystem are reasonably consistent. Because this means that these similar ecosystems are going to have similar communities. And this could be because of migration or it might in fact be through natural selection. So in the next few slides, we're really going to be following far uh, very closely uh, your textbook, specifically pages 359 to 364. So with our freshwater ponds, the common abiotic factors are just listed there. So there's low oxygen, and that's because it's generally quite cold and the water is very still. So we're going to have low oxygen content. We're also going to be variable light intensity because light doesn't diffuse in water especially well. Um, and then suspended mud and those sorts of things are going to block some of that light. We're not going to have a lot of solutes dissolved in there. Again, because it's still water and it's quite cold, diffusion is going to be slow. And then this higher density and viscosity compared to air. So it's much more difficult for movement through exchange of substances in water. Now that particular one isn't unique to fresh water, whereas the others are quite specific to this freshwater pond environment. The common biotic factors then, we're going to have predation, competition, disease, and then we're also going to have human behavior. So the examples of predation there are, you have a, a bird population perhaps that lives around that freshwater pond that's going to be eating a lot of the insects, uh, the insect larvae that are laid within that pond. Uh, the competition is going to be competition for food, so continuing that example, there are going to be small fish as well as those birds that are going to be competing for that same food source, the insect larvae. Disease, that's going to be, um, that's not unique to freshwater ponds, but it is, uh, it is an important biotic factor. And specifically, we're looking at um, bacterial disease, if we're considering it as a biotic factor. And then human behavior, we're going to talk in a bit more detail towards the end of our slideshow about that. So that's our freshwater pond components. Now, they have driven a specific community where we have producers. So examples of producers are floating plants. We'll have water's edge plants, so rushes and reeds. We'll have some amphibious plants, so plants that are able to live both in and out of water, and some fully submerged plants. Because of the low oxygen content in this water, though, a lot of those plants are going to need to have their leaves above the water or on the water line so that they can actually exchange oxygen with the air. And the floating plants, water edge plants and amphibious plants are really good examples of that. Fully submerged plants will obviously need very specific adaptations to make sure they can get the oxygen they need for that cellular respiration process for actually getting energy. Animals, lots of surface dwelling insects, uh, organisms that grow just below the water. So for example, mosquito larvae, uh, there's gonna be water birds, which I mentioned before. Other insects, so not just surface dwelling insects, it will be fish, amphibians, reptiles, and some mollusks, so snails and some shell, um, shellfish sort of creatures. Each of these have specific adaptations that will allow them to thrive in that ecosystem. Once we've gone through all of the ecosystems and communities, we're going to shift over to the board and we'll go through a little bit about how exactly these consistencies are flowed through and, and what our own thinking sort of does when we think about these places. So we look now at sclerophyll forest. Now, a sclerophyll forest is really what we're talking about here is a, a eucalypt forest where, or, or something along those lines where it's a native Australian forest typically, uh, which will have a large amount of trees that are able to withstand um, quite dry and warm conditions. So the abiotic factors there, high temperatures, limited water, lots of light, very little nutrients in the soil, and then a very high likelihood of fire. So the organisms that live there are going to need to be able to adapt to those abiotic factors. The biotic factors, again, predation, competition, disease, human behavior, and a new one, symbiosis. So this is what we've been talking about before. Now, you might be interested as to why specifically a symbiosis is mentioned in sclerophyll forests and not in the um, freshwater pond. 
If we think about that abiotic factor of low nutrient levels in soil, symbiosis is going to increase the amount of nutrients in the soil. If we consider, as an example, bacteria that are growing on root nodules of plants, they're going to be able to take nitrogen from the soil or from the atmosphere and convert it into something that the plants can then use so that they can get the nitrogen that they need to overcome that low nutrition. So sometimes these biotic factors are actually in place to overcome some of the abiotic factors or the abiotic limitations. So that's our sclerophyll forest. When we're looking now at our um, community, the producers here are largely low-lying shrubs, grasses, and very large trees. So plants in these areas are called sclerophylls due to their adaptations to the conditions. So a sclerophyll has some specific characteristics, uh, some of which are thin leaves, they have a waxy cuticle, which is basically like a waxy covering over their leaves. And they're typically two-sided leaves. One side will have, the, uh, have a, a, a high concentration of chlorophyll, and the opposite side will have quite a low concentration. Now, when we go out to um, Cleveland, you'll actually be able to observe this. And you can observe it by looking at the different sides, and you'll notice that one side is far greener than the other side. In the animals, insects, reptiles, mammals, and birds. So not quite as much diversity here, and we can think about that, particularly when we, again, when we go out to Cleveland, we'll be able to uh, analyze exactly why that might be. Now when we're looking at uh, the Australian desert, the components here, very high light intensity, extraordinarily low nutrient levels, very low rainfall. However, sometimes we do get flooding rates, especially up north, where we're looking at um, not so much Queensland, but particularly the Northern Territory and, and Northern Western Australia very low rainfall through certain parts of the year, but then in, in infrequent flooding rains can occur. The biotic factors, extraordinarily small amounts of vegetation, very little leaf litter or very little hummus, so that really relates to our low nutrient levels. There's a, a lot of competition because there's not many resources available, and obviously there's going to be predation. So there's a couple of important factors that are consistent. Predation is a regular factor. Competition is a regular factor, uh, and biotic factor at least. We're talking about light intensity as well. So we have to consider all of these things and think, well, why are these so important? When we're looking at light intensity, well, the light intensity is going to determine how much photosynthesis is occurring. The more photosynthesis, the more energy we should have. But if there is too much light, then we're actually going to be heating up the water in those leaves, so we're going to have a lot of water loss from the leaves. And if there's not a lot of rainfall to replace that water loss, then we're going to have significant problems for these plants. They're going to need to adapt. Now, if our plants are going to have to adapt, they're going to reduce the amount of energy they put into certain things, and that may end up reducing the amount of food available for consumers, so that we end up with quite a squashed kind of community, where there is a limited amount of food for each level, and so we have these very small communities with potentially lots of population diversity, but not a lot of individual uh, individual creatures. There's a low abundance, a low number of, of creatures. When we're looking at the community, the plants, extremely hardy plants. So these are plants that have had incredible numbers of um, adaptations. So spinifex, saltbush, sturt desert pea, uh, we can think overseas about cactuses and, and those sorts of plants which are uh, so important in the um, desert community ecosystem. A uh, uh, desert community, sorry. Uh, with animals, <clears throat> very often we'll see migratory birds. Birds that will fly in during the wet season when we have this explosion of life, and then they'll fly out once the dry season returns. Reptiles, which are less migratory, crustaceans, which are basically not migratory at all. Uh, mammals, insects, and amphibians. So quite a diversity of populations we've got listed there, but they'll often be in quite a small abundance. There won't be quite as many of them individually. Here we have our key terms, page 365, you need to check. Chapter review 4.3, uh, that's pages 366 to 368. All questions there. What I want to do now before I finish the video, and we'll, we'll close on this, is just jump over to the board. So I'm going to change the video over now. What I have on the board here, and I, I missed ex pointing this out, when we draw figures, always we need to have a label and a descriptive title. So down the bottom here I have the label, table 1, because it's a table. It's not a figure, or it's not just a figure, it's a table. And it's the first table I've drawn, so that's why I give it the number one. And then I've described what's there. Now, it's not particularly long. Common animal, animals found in specific communities or ecosystems. 
So let's look at the left-hand side, our freshwater pond ecosystem. We have ducks, fish, mosquitoes. Those are the three that are considered. And they have specific adaptations to survive in that community or that ecosystem. So ducks we will find in almost all freshwater ecosystems. They might be slightly different. So they might be a different type of duck, a different species of duck. But we will always find ducks or almost always find ducks. The same for fish. Freshwater ecosystems, as long as they're healthy, as long as they haven't been destroyed by the eutrophication, we will always find fish. And then lastly, mosquitoes, especially mosquito larvae. Now we have to then ask ourselves, if in a freshwater ecosystem we're always finding these animals, why? And it's because they have the right adaptations to survive in that ecosystem. If we create artificially a freshwater pond, what will arise? Ducks, mosquitoes, and fish, potentially. And so we have this consistency where when we have the right abiotic conditions, the biotic elements arrive. Now, they might take a long time, and some of them might not be able to get there by themselves. We're thinking of fish. If you just dig a hole in your backyard and fill it with water, the fish aren't going to magically appear. But we have this consistency. The same for our sclerophyll forest. We find koalas and kookaburras and kangaroos. Nice alliteration there. Yes, that was deliberate. But we will always find them. If you plant a sclerophyll forest, the koalas will come. The kookaburras will come. And if you let them, the kangaroos will come. And that's because the abiotic elements that you have put there, so the um, amount of um, light, the temperature, the biotic elements as well, so the plants that you've put in there, all of those elements work together and they will attract these animals. And then lastly, our desert ecosystem. Again, we have kangaroos, lizards and snakes. If you wipe out an area, remove all the leaf litter, make the abiotic elements present, then you will have these animals arrive. Now, if you force animals into an area, so say you take a fish from the pond and put it in the desert, the outcome is death. The abiotic elements are a really important determinant of whether or not an organism can survive. And it's not just because the fish bakes in the sun. Yes, it might, but it also can't breathe air. So the absence of water, that abiotic element, is also having that impact there. So the abiotic parts, the abiotic components of these ecosystems are what drive the communities that are present and what push the communities towards specific adaptations. And if you change the ecosystem, then you're going to change the organisms that are there because they either won't have the adaptations to survive that change, or they will be outcompeted by organisms that are better adapted for that change. So it's this really critical relationship you must understand between the abiotic elements and the biotic elements that are present, the living parts and the non-living parts. We can think about them as resources, living and non-living. And if the non-living resources are conducive to the living resources that are present, then we're going to set up these communities. Okay, Year 11s, that's the end of our video for today. Remember, emails, asking questions in class. Make sure you're keeping up to date with those uh, questions from the textbook uh, so that we can make sure that coming to the test in the next couple of weeks, you're likely to be successful.